uh, the murder of 19 kids, most of them under 10 years of age. Um, and I don't think uh, it would be appropriate for us to, to begin this meeting without at least uh, acknowledging what happened. And I'm sure everybody here, like me, either is concerned about their children uh, or grandchildren. And, and uh, that concern has to uh, actually be uh, uh, turned into some kind of way in which we can stop uh, the, this carnage uh, that we're experiencing around the country. And um, it's hard to go any further, but uh, we are now called to order. And uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the subcommittee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee, not on this subcommittee, are authorized to participate in today's hearing. The hearing is entitled Reauthorization and Reform of the National Flood Insurance Program. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. This hearing is a continuation of efforts to get a bipartisan, I want to say it again, a bipartisan agreement on a long-term reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP. Flooding is the most frequent, severe weather threat and the costless, uh, uh, costless uh, natural disaster facing the nation. 90% of all natural disasters in the United States involve flooding and high-risk flood areas are not the only ones at risk. About 25% of flood insurance claims come from moderate to low risk areas. Several factors contribute to the cost of flood disasters, including increased exposure of assets and the number of assets at risk, vulnerability of assets and the location of those assets, and frankly, the impact of climate change. In particular, Federal data indicates that climate change is supercharging the frequency and intensity of certain types of extreme weather events. Most notably, the potential for extremely heavy rainfall is becoming more and more common and exacerbating hurricane and flood events. As highlighted by the United States Environmental Agency's report on climate change and social vulnerability, the impacts of climate change are felt broadly to differing degrees, but racial and ethnic minority communities are particularly vulnerable to the greatest impacts of climate change. It is often the case that the people are least able to prepare and cope with flooding events or disproportionately exposed. Uh, I am in my office here in Kansas City, Missouri, and only maybe 50 yards from Brush Creek uh, which came out of its banks a few years ago and drowned 25 people. And then a, a year and a half later, another 10 individuals. So flood insurance is critical to safeguarding guarding the financial stability of American investments and ensuring the American families, businesses, and communities can recover from these unfortunate events. In times of significant loss, insurance is set up as financial first responders in helping customers receive from significant loss to recover, excuse me, from significant loss and achieve greater financial stability. The program must be affordable and accessible to those who need it. The NFIP is the principal provider of primary flood insurance in the United States, covering nearly 5 million households and businesses across the country for a total of over $1.3 trillion in flood insurance coverage. Today, communities participated in the NFIP cover an estimated 93% of the United States population. As we all are aware, the last long-term reauthorization of the NFIP occurred when Congress passed the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012. Uh, I was here at the time and, and looked at and marveled over the fact that uh, Representative Bigger uh, a Republican and Maxine Waters, a Democrat, were able to get together to create this reform, uh, which was subsequently amended by the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. Since the end of fiscal year 2017, 
the NFIP has had 19, 19 short-term reauthorizations and has even experienced brief lapses in the program risk leaving American families, families unprotected. And because the NFIP is then unable to enter into new flood insurance contracts, the housing marked uh, marked faith faces without widespread market marker instability due to the stalling of mortgage processing for homes that are statutorily required to have flood insurance. According to estimates from the National Association of Realtors, around 40,000 home sales are lost or interrupted every month that the NFIP's authority lapses. The NFIP's author authorization is currently set to expire on September 30th, 2022. However, the NFIP is not just an insurance program. The program does provide access to primary flood insurance, but also seeks to mitigate and reduce the nation's comprehensive flood risk. The NFIP accomplishes this through floodplain management, floodplain mapping, and flood mitigation. Given compounding flood risk, there is an increased need to focus on where we build, how we build, and to invest an infrastructure that is designed for the 21st century climate. On November 15th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which included $3.5 billion for flood mitigation and $500 million in grants to states for revolving loans for hazard mitigation through a new risk program called the Safeguarding Tomorrow Through Ongoing Risk Mitigation. Under the bold leadership of our chair, Maxine Waters, uh, on November 19th, 2022, the House passed the Build Back Better Act. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, discontinue because I'm going over. I want to recognize now uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Hill. You're now recognized for five minutes. Well, I thank my friend, the, the chairman, and let me, if I need a minute 30 uh, later today, I hope you'll yield it to me. Yes, sir. Uh, let, me share, let me share my heartfelt uh, uh, sharing of your concern expressed about this uh, horrible tragedy in Uvalde, uh, a wonderful community, a place I've visited many times, and, and all of us uh, prize our, our most prized asset, our kids, and it's 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 heartbreaking. So I hope we can continue to find ways to support our schools, support our families. So thank you for mentioning that, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you holding this hearing on a topic that we know is important. Uh, but we never seem over this Congress to ever want to discuss. So this is a big day for uh, our committee. And that is, how do we fix the National Flood Insurance Program? Since I first came to Congress back in 2015, under Chairman Henserling's leadership, we worked in a bipartisan way on strengthening the flood mitigation programs and how to strengthen and make more uh, realistic and appropriate our National Flood Program. In fact, under Chairman Henserling, the committee held flood-related hearings in June 2015, November 2015, twice in January of 2016, twice in March of 2017, and then again in 2017. And that makes sense because it's a well-known fact that uh, floods are the most common, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, and most expensive natural disaster that communities face here in our country. What's less well known is that floods are also the deadliest natural disaster in the U.S., responsible for 57 deaths in 2020 and an average of 94 deaths each year over the past decade. And that is unacceptable for our country and a real challenge to our families and our communities. And that's why I'm pleased that the majority started things off on the right foot under Chair Waters with its first flood reform hearing that we held back in March of 2019. Sadly, since that time, uh, that unfortunately was the last flood reform hearing until we had today, more than three years and two months later. So quite frankly, that's just not going to cut it if we're really serious about bipartisan legislative reforms. Part of the reason why we don't talk about flood is uh, this committee is not even really in control of NFIB's reauthorization process anymore. Instead of doing the hard work here, on a bipartisan basis and reforming and reauthorizing the National Flood Program to ensure its long-term financially sustainable position, the majority has left the program on autopilot through a series of short-term extensions on appropriations bills. This is the detriment to not only of NFIP policyholders, but American taxpayers and members of this committee 
from both sides of the aisle. Since the last full NFIP reauthorization expired back in September of 2017, the program's been extended on a short-term basis a shocking 21 times, every time without a single reform attached. That includes an incredible 11 times under Chair Waters, who has yet to take an NFIP reform bill to the House floor under her tenure. Boy, the appropriators have carried our authorizations uh, so often on their legislative vehicles. I'm surprised they aren't charging us a freight charge. All of this, of course, is a shame because it was a time when it looked like we were on the verge of a breakthrough when this committee unanimously reported a five-year reform and authorization bill in June of 2019. Let me remind our listeners, a unanimous vote in committee but Chair Waters never got that bill to the floor and then abandoned the good faith efforts and bipartisan work product by including now partisan flood reforms with zero Republican input that were in the Build Back Better bill. And we know how that ended. So looking, thinking, fixing the NFIP is not easy, but it's important. And that includes supporting FEMA's risk rating 2.0 methodology and providing greater private flood insurance options for policyholders. The best way to deliver lower flood insurance rates is through lower flood risk. And risk rating 2.0 is the only reform that lowers annual premiums by matching rates to the actual risk faced by individual policyholders. Policyholders who disagree with those changes deserve to have options other than NFIP, which is why I've been a large supporter of making sure that we have uh, better rates, better terms from non-governmental flood providers. There are many areas on which Democrats and Republicans can agree, like supporting enhanced pre-flood mitigation, ending discounts for properties each and every year, eliminating fraud in the claims process, and considering a targeted means-tested affordability program that helps out low-income policyholders. So there's a lot of room for bipartisan work, and I look forward to working with my friend, Mr. Cleaver, and I yield back to you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member uh, Hill. Uh, the chair now recognizes the chairwoman of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters. Is the chair of, uh, available at this time? Well, we may we may uh, have to come back uh, at a later uh, moment, but uh, today we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. First, we have Ms. Carolyn Kuski, who is the Executive Director of the Warden Risk Center. Next, we have Karen McHugh, who is the NFIP Coordinator for the State of Missouri. Next, we have Ariel Riviera Miranda, who is the founder, uh, who is the founder and agency principal of Deer Insurance. And then finally, we have Roy Wright, who is the President and CEO of the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Witnesses are reminded that uh, their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer that will indicate how much time you have left. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer so that we can be respectful of both witnesses and committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Kuski, you are now recognized for five minutes to give a, an oral pres presentation of your testimony. Subcommittee Chair Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, and the esteemed members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm the Executive Director of the Wharton Risk Center at the University of Pennsylvania. The National Flood Insurance Program has long been a focus of work at the center and my own research, and it's this work and that of my colleagues which informs my testimony today. Prior research has found that lower income groups suffer disproportionately from disasters like floods and recover less quickly. A key driver of these inequitable recoveries is the lack of access to necessary financial resources for repairs and rebuilding. Severe floods take a huge financial toll on households. As they work to repair and rebuild, most Americans struggle with the needed funds. They don't have sufficient savings, credit can be burdensome or impossible to access, and federal assistance is typically insufficient and too delayed. That leaves insurance. Yet many at-risk households are uninsured against flooding. This is problematic because prior research has found that if individuals have insurance, they recover better and faster. 
when households have the needed funds for repairs and rebuilding, they can more quickly resume normal economic activities and have less need for public sector assistance programs. Yet the people who need insurance the most are the least able to afford it. Last month, FEMA completed rollout of risk rating 2.0. This new pricing methodology harnesses modern data and modeling tools to better price flood risk at a given property. While there's certainly still some adjustments that are no doubt warranted, this modernization of rate setting is long overdue. It will undo many cross subsidies across flood zones. It will also take a small step in improving affordability by undoing a regressive cross subsidy from lower valued to higher valued homes, because previously the program did not adjust pricing for the value of the home or the share that was in insured. While this is an important change, it is not a means-tested assistance program for flood insurance. And the need for such a program has been recognized for a decade and studied by many groups, and it's time to enact it. I'll raise just a couple design points. First, I'd urge the committee to consider a tiered program that would provide assistance on a sliding scale and prevent there being an abrupt cutoff to benefits. Second, draft legislation has suggested limiting access to existing policyholders only, but as suggested in FEMA's affordability framework report, there are many households right now at risk of flooding who are not current policyholders precisely because they cannot afford to purchase a policy. These are the very households we should wish to help. As such, I believe the assistance program should offer help to any qualifying household, regardless of current policy status. That will allow households that have been locked out of the program because of affordability concerns to access the financial benefits of insurance. One possible objective is perverse incentives to, bu to build on safely or move into high risk areas. And I do think that if we were considering rate suppression across all policyholders, that would be an important concern. There's not much evidence, though, that when we limit our look at low income populations, that premium support would have this perverse impact. Many of these households are trapped in risky locations and in unsafe housing because they can't afford the necessary retrofits or to move to safer ground. So I thus think we need to couple risk based pricing to send those signals to the market with explicit means testing for assistance. We also need to do more to promote the needed investments in risk reduction and pricing alone won't achieve that. One problem is lack of risk awareness. Some NFIP rules are currently hindering full information on flood risk from reaching markets. Only current policyholders can request information on prior claims. There's nowhere to quickly look up premiums and potential home buyers are never told if a home they're purchasing is about to become a repetitive loss property. A simple online tool should provide all that information and more. It's financially material and I don't think should be kept hidden. Of course, for current homeowners in risky areas, we also need to make it easier for them to get help reducing their risk to maintain property values and lower insurance costs. While the NFIP has many laudable initiatives to reduce flood losses, there's still more to do, and buyouts is one of those areas. The timing of buyouts take too long to get to homeowners. Households, especially those of limited means, can't wait the years it takes. Many will have to begin rebuilding to make their homes safe for habitation using partial or full flood insurance payouts only to have the home demolished months or years later in a buyout, and that's just wasted funds. So a critical reform would be making federal dollars available immediately after a flood for buyouts or to reimburse local governments that do this. And this could be tied to incentives for local communities to engage in pre-disaster planning to speed the buyout process on their end. I'll end by noting that risk reduction is a complement to insurance. As we lower disaster risk, we make it easier and cheaper to insure against them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Hugh uh, McHugh. You are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Ms. McHugh. You're not recognized. Uh... Good afternoon, Chairman Waters, Chairman Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, and members of the committee. I'm Karen McHugh, a Regional Director of the Association of State Floodplain Managers and the NFIP Coordinator for the State of Missouri. I am honored to be testifying today about a program that our organization and our members consider essential to our nation's flood loss reduction efforts the National Flood Insurance Program. Our, our written statement identifies over 20 reform ideas for your consideration. 
I've worked nearly 30 years in the world of floodplain management regulation. It's given me a personal perspective on several of ASFPM's reauthorization and reform priorities. It's of paramount importance that NFIP participating states have authorizing legislation to provide full flood risk disclosure for all property transactions prior to closing on sales or signing rental contracts. This is of particular significance to me. Too many times I have listened to home buyers sobbing on the phone who were surprised to learn at the closing table that their new house is in a high risk floodplain and don't know how they will pay for the required flood insurance. Even more distressing, some property owners have shared with me that they do not learn about their flooding risk until their home has already been flooded. In 1930, 1993, I was working as a floodplain administrator when increased cost of compliance, or ICC, was first included in the National Flood Insurance Reform Act of 1994. ICC gives added coverage to structures located in FEMA mapped special flood hazard areas to anyone that has an active flood insurance policy. I saw firsthand how the added coverage helps homeowner, homeowners and communities recover after a flooding event. Since the program became effective, I have witnessed buildings relocated to higher, safer ground. I have seen homes elevated safely above the water surface so that during the next flooding event, there was no damage to the building whatsoever. In our small towns, dry floodproofing historic structures is the only way that these beautiful buildings can be saved, since the integrity of historic buildings is harmed by repeated flooding. The limit of liability coverage was raised 20 years ago to $30,000 from the previous limit of $20,000. The average cost to lift a house and replace the foundation is now pushing $100,000. Increasing the ICC limit to at least $90,000 is long overdue. To allow adequate funding for structures to be brought out of harm's way by elevating or being removed from the high-risk flood area has been proven to save lives and property and taxpayer costs from the devastating effects of flooding. It is my great pleasure to work socially or economically disadvantaged communities to deliver NFIP education, training, and outreach so that crucial NFIP principles can be conveyed with maximum efficiency to assure equitable program delivery. My staff and I provide compliance solutions to our underserved communities in Missouri by performing community assistant contacts visits, uh, offering technical assistance, offering one-on-one -on -one help with substantial damage determination before and after flooding events, and we will continue bringing NFIP workshop training to economically disadvantaged populations. The federal government's authorization of the Community Assistance Program, including provide, providing annual funding at a minimum of $20 million, will ensure a support mechanism for building state capacity to efficiently and effectively assist communities in managing and mitigating their flood risks. In closing, I would like to state that NFIP re reauthorization is an opportunity for Congress to take bold steps to reduce the program's complexity and strengthen the NFIP's financial framework so the NFIP can continue protecting individuals and property from the the devastating and unfortunately growing impacts of flooding. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. McHugh, for your testimony. I now recognize uh, Ms. Rivera Miranda. You're now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Good afternoon, Chairman Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much for holding this hearing and for inviting me to be a part of it. My name is Ariel Rivera Miranda, and I am the founder and agency principal of Deer Insurance Agency, which is an independent insurance agency located in Jacksonville, Florida. I am currently the secretary of the National Association of Professional Insurance Agents, also known as PIA. I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and had over, have over 18 years of experience in the insurance industry. 
I have been an independent insurance agency since I was 22, which is when I started my first agency. In my time as an independent agent, I have founded and operated insurance agencies in Puerto Rico and in Florida. In my current capacity, I sell flood insurance products through the, both the National Flood Insurance Program and the private market. I am here on behalf of PIA, but my remarks today represent my personal views and not necessarily those of PIA as an organization. I'd like to begin by talking about the vital role of the independent insurance agent in the marketing, sale, and service of NFIP policies. Independent agents are the face of the program. We are, quote unquote, the first responders to both clients and carriers. To adequately serve our customer, we must remain up to date on ever-changing laws and regulations governing flood insurance requirements. And historically, we have also had to keep pace with constant changes to the program involving maps, flood zones, and relevant community participation. Agents explain this complicated program to consumers and interpret changes to the program as needed for their policyholders and prospects. They also assist with home closings and ensure to the best of their ability that policy renewals are completed on time. Agents stake their reputation on their customer service and the NFIP has always been a challenging program. When consumers are confused about how the program works, they call their agents. When, the, when they become frustrated over a lapse or prospective lapse, when a policy or requirement changes, when mapping issues arise, consumers call their agents. Most importantly, when consumers face a loss, they call their agents. We're also on the front lines of risk rating 2.0. We strongly support risk rating 2.0 because it will help the NFIP move toward solvency while also providing policyholders with more accurate information about their property's flood risk. With better information, we hope property owners will learn more about their flood of, or the risk of flood, engage in mitigation efforts where needed, and ultimately purchase and retain flood insurance that matches their risk. As independent agents have gained experience with explaining risk rating 2.0 to policyholders, it's become clear that we need more information about how the new rating factors combine to produce a risk rating 2.0 rate. Risk rating 2.0 is fully underway. Every policy rating and renew from now on will be rated using it. What we need now is greater public understanding, which will be bolstered by increased transparency in the system. Greater transparency would also make it easier for agents to explain to our customers why their rates are changing. While FEMA continues to release helpful explanatory material, it remains difficult to explain some rate increases, even though it has been nearly eight months since the new rating system began. Last but certainly not least, the reauthorization of the NFIP is critically important. The NFIP has now been extended about 20 times since 2017 and will expire again on September 30th, 2022. In the past five years, the program has been extended for weeks or even days at a time. I cannot overstate the detrimental effect of short-term extensions on the program overall. Every short-term extension is another chance for a lapse. The threat of a lapse leaves everyone involved in the program in a terrible position. Home buyers and sellers look to their insurance agents and others involved in the transaction to solve a problem over which they have no control. During a lapse, consumers are unable to renew existing policies or even purchase new ones and lapses may disrupt real estate transactions, especially if they involve properties in mandatory purchase areas. Prior lapses are estimated to have disrupted over a thousand homes a day, and the longer the lapse, the greater the impact. Additionally, needed updates to the program are long overdue. With support reforms like a continuous coverage provision, the continuation of progress towards full risk rates to keep the program solvent, and at the same time, the creation of an affordability framework to minimize potential attrition from the program, the creation of an agent-specific advisory council, or with, council within FEMA, and increased transparency for policyholders. I urge Congress to build on the progress made in 2019 when the full committee unanimously passed a long-term bipartisan reauthorization and reform package. We support many of the provisions of the bills listed today. Thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rivera Miranda. Uh, Mr. Wright, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Members of the subcommittee, uh, Chair uh, Chair Waters, and I'm ranking uh, Member French. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to rejoin the reauthorization dialogue. In the spring of 2017, when I led FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program, I testified before the full committee. I've enjoyed good relationship with both sides of the aisle, so I appreciate this opportunity to rejoin the conversation. Congress is wrapping up six years of reauthorization, uh, but you've delivered those six years 
in 21 small chunks. Congress must pass long-term reauthorization that provides the program with stability. So four key thoughts I wanna to highlight today. First, breaking the cycle of loss. FEMA's repetitive loss home acquisition programs or those buyouts, they, they take years. In that time, the NFIP could have paid to rebuild a house at least twice and then pay to demolish it. I don't have time to retell it here, but my written testimony speaks about a policyholder named Edith who called me during Hurricane Harvey seeking help with an immediate buyout. She didn't want a third claim paid. She wanted to start over. The recently introduced Cast and Blumenauer bill offers a clear way forward. Offer the buyout at the point of the catastrophic claim, the very time Edith called me seeking help. You can plow the indemnified uh, claim value into the acquisition project, and that will reduce the overall cost, and it expedites the recovery timeline for the impacted family. Second, inflation. We must address the real impacts inflation has on the NFIP. Uh, two sets of homeowners. A, those who cannot afford the premiums due to the increases in costs of other goods and services. And B, those who cannot afford to rebuild within the limited insurance claim, the $250,000 set in existing law. And I want to speak to that second group. The average sale price for homes in this country has increased by more than 300% since 1994. And yet the NFIP policy limits remain at $250,000. Here's the impact of Congress's inaction. When hurricanes make landfall in the United States this year, Americans who did the right thing and bought flood insurance will learn the consequences of being underinsured. When the cost of rebuilding their home comes in at $370,000 and they only have $250,000 available in coverage, they will be underwater for the second time. Many will blame inflation, but while not unrelated, the principal fault for the protection gap in their coverage will reside with Congress because Congress continues to limit the amount of insurance homeowners are permitted to buy. Inflation will also negatively impact the fiscal underpinning of the program. The debt held by the NFIP is about to get walloped by rising interest rates. And while I do acknowledge there is not a bipartisan legislative path today to resolve the outstanding debt, I must warn you, this will come back to haunt you, FEMA, and those who depend on the NFIP. Last year, FEMA paid $350 million to service its debt, almost 10% of its premium revenue. When FEMA is paying $700 million, $800 million, or even $1 billion a year in interest on the NFIP's residual debt, those funds will come and take away from the ability to pay valid claims, all because of Katrina's impacts some 17 years ago. Two important things as I close, risk rating 2.0, simply it is delivering on its objectives, a fair approach to setting insurance premium that resembles underwriting practices used for other perils. Ironically, the criticisms I've heard of risk rating 2.0 have little to do with the actual risk measurements themselves, the, the data, methods, and accuracy. Instead, the criticisms focus on the difficulty of living with the knowledge of their risk and the cost of their flood risk. On the other side of the coin, nearly two thirds of policyholders are seeing those incremental increases that resemble their past trajectory. And then nearly a quarter of all NFIP policyholders are seeing price decreases, sometimes 200 to, or even 1,000 per year. Think about that. In a time of high inflation, the cost of material and labor is soaring. These policyholders are experiencing cheaper prices. Finally, affordability. I do encourage this Congress and FEMA to identify ways to assist low and moderate income households to lessen the financial burden of flood insurance. Yeah, I'll tell you, Congress has to decide how much money it wants to invest into an affordability program each year. The NFIP cannot pay for such a program inside of its premium revenue. That would be inequitable and really it undermines the financial stability of the program. With that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wright, uh, for, for your testimony. Uh, the chair recognizes now uh, Mr. Franklin W. Nutter, president of Reinsurance Association of America. You now have five minutes to make an oral presentation of your testimony. Uh, Chairman Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, uh, Chairwoman Waters, and other distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. The Reinsurance Association supports a long-term reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program 
encourages certain reforms and appreciates the committee starting this formal conversation about both. Today, the NFIP remains on GAO's high risk list, is $20.5 billion in debt and continues to have policies that distort risk assessment by builders, local officials, property buyers, and the NFIP policyholders themselves. Subsidized rates and statutory caps on rates may be popular with some beneficiaries, but they increase the cross subsidy from low or no risk persons and taxpayers to those living in high risk flood areas. Starting in 2011, Congress took steps to address the fundamental flaws in the NFIP and toward removing inequitable and unjustifiable rate subsidies. The NFIP today is on a path toward a stronger financial framework and resiliency to pay claims. The REA encourages Congress to avoid retreating from this progress and to enact reforms that will improve the program to the benefit of those facing the flood risk and taxpayers alike. To that end, I encourage flood reform legislation to strengthen NFIP's financial framework and resiliency by preserving the National Flood Insurance Program's successful reinsurance program as well as risk rating 2.0. In 2017, the reinsurance program's first year, FEMA collected over a billion dollars from private to help pay Hurricane Harvey related claims. The program successfully renewed the following year and has over $2.5 billion available to collect from the private sector after a qualifying 2022 loss event. Risk rating 2.0, FEMA's new pricing methodology more precisely reflects property specific flood risk with more advanced actuarial tools and catastrophe models. Based on FEMA's data, the REA developed a risk rating 2.0 analytical tool, which shows that 89% of policies premiums will decrease or remain stable, and premiums will decrease for almost half a million NFIP single family residential policies. Of note is that 0% of the premiums uh, would have decreased under FEMA's previous pricing, pricing methodology, and under risk rating 2.0, higher premiums increases are no longer attaching to lower valued properties. To address the problem of significant underinsured and uninsured but at risk population, reauthorization legislation should facilitate the development of a private flood insurance market by preserving risk rating 2.0, removing impediments to consumer choice by enacting Representative Castor and Luke DeMeyer's continuous coverage bill so consumers can leave the NFIP secure a private flood policy, and later reassume an NFIP policy without penalty, and increase insurance options for consumers by enacting Representative Luke DeMeyer's amendment that would provide FEMA additional tools to strengthen the public-private insurance partnership with private insurers and explore risk-sharing opportunities. Flood reform legislation should aim to close the flood insurance gap by requiring the development of a comprehensive strategy and address the natural disaster insurance protection gap in the U.S. and the risk it poses to property insurers, taxpayers, and businesses. By seeing and aligning federal housing agencies' private flood regulations with those issued by federal lending institutions. And lastly, flood reform legislation should create resilient and insurable communities. Several suggestions, such as those by the Smarter Safer Coalition and Build Strong Coalitions, of which the REA is a, is a member, are included in my written testimony. The REA has also developed a proposal called the Community Disaster Resilience Zone, or CEDARS, which would improve resilience in communities that are most in need and most at risk in natural disasters, including flooding. Initial bipartisan, bicameral legislation, the CEDARS Act of 2022, is supported by a diverse coalition of 30 national organizations. We look forward to working with the committee to further develop the CEDARS proposal. The REA and its members welcome the opportunity to work with you on the long-term reauthorization and reform legislation, and thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Nutter. Uh, the chair now recognizes the chair of the Full Financial Services Committee for a statement and to begin our questioning. Uh, ranking uh, the Chairwoman Maxine Waters, you're now recognized. Thank you so very much, Mr. Cleaver, for holding this most important and timely meeting. The National Flood Insurance Program is a key part of the federal government's strategy to be better prepared in the face of climate change, which is causing natural disasters in increasing frequency and magnitude. I've worked for decades to strengthen the NFIP 
and to stress the importance of mapping and mitigation to avoid the damage that flooding cause, causes in the first place, rather than waiting until it's too late and paying for disaster relief efforts. The last time that Congress passed a long-term reauthorization of the NFIP, as been said several times, was in 2012, when I worked across the aisle with Representative Judy Biggert uh, to get it done. A decade after we passed the Biggert Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, Congress must institute reforms that improve the long-term stability of the program. So Mr. Wright, FEMA has made significant progress in analyzing the affordability challenges of its policyholders and has submitted an affordability framework to Congress. FEMA prepared this framework specifically in response to legislation that Congress passed in 2014, which was meant to address higher premium costs uh, that policyholders had paid. Now, my draft bill to reauthorize the NFIP would stand up a pilot program to offer means tested assistance for low and moderate income households to help them afford flood insurance. Is this enough? Uh, would this be an effective first step in tackling the affordability challenges that FEMA has laid out? Uh, should we be thinking bigger uh, instead of a pilot program? Could you help me out with your thoughts about that? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, as you know, I was out of FEMA when those programs were stood up and that study was done and sent forward. And the agency has done more work since I departed. And so I can't speak definitively for where those pieces are at. Something needs to move. Ultimately, we need to find the right balance so that it really is those in need. There's got to be caps on where it's available. I think a pilot program may be too small at this point. But I do think that we've got to start incrementally knowing that we will learn things because the agency has never done something like this before. Uh, and so some kind of ways that allows that to A, meet the need and continue to scale and improve uh, as it's implemented. Well, thank you very much because I'm too worried that a pilot program may be too small, a little bit too late maybe, and we need to be thinking bigger. And I would hope that you with your background, your experience would feel free uh, to help us out in any way that you could with any suggestions that you may have. So now I wanna now turn to risk rating 2.0, which went into effect on April 1st of this year. Uh, Mr. Kuski, uh, FEMA's new test rating methodology is intended to modernize the way that NFIP prices its policies so that they better reflect the risk associated with the properties they cover. Many members of Congress were concerned that risk rating 2.0 would result in sharp increases in premiums for their constituents. However, there are rate caps in current statute that prevent premiums from going up over a certain percentage each year, and FEMA also has discretion to manage those increases and rarely maxes out those rate caps. Moreover, many policyholders are seeing decreases, not increases in their premium. So, Dr. Kuski, in the two months that risk rating tool has been in effect, in effect, what can you tell us about the kinds of increases in premiums that policyholders are seeing? Do you think current statutory rate caps and FEMA's discretion to set rates have been sufficient to prevent sharp increases in premiums from year to year? Yes, thank you for the question. I think the caps on rates are important to have a glide path for policyholders into full risk rates. So I think that's important to maintain. I think that what we're seeing so far, though, is that the places of very high risk are the places where there's going to be high rates. And those are concentrated in certain communities and among certain households, even within communities. And those are really important areas to be targeting mitigation along with this as the um, antidote to increasing rates. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't see the time clock here. Do I have any more time left? Uh, you, you do. I, uh, I, I want to apologize to uh, the ranking member earlier. Um, I, I'm not able to see a, a clock, but uh, Chairwoman Waters, uh, why don't you proceed until the, uh, we, we, I'd ask the staff to try to get a, a 
clock up so that we can all see it. But how much time please. do we have? How much time do I have left? I don't have a timer here. Still the magical minute left. Yes. Oh, that's okay. I, I'm going to yield back my time so everybody will get an opportunity to get their questions in. And I hope someone is going to talk about debt forgiveness. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we recognize now uh, Mr. Hill, uh, the ranking member from Arkansas. Mr. Hill, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank Chair Waters for her comments as well on this topic. This is a topic that uh, she's been keenly engaged in for many years. And so, as I said to you, uh, Mr. Cleaver, I'm glad that we're finally in this Congress getting into a, a detailed conversation about this. Thank you. Um, I will say that uh, Mr. Nutter in his testimony on page three uh, says, as it currently operates, the NFIP is not an insurance program. And I found that a interesting and provocative statement. And it always concerns me uh, about government programs that are set up for one reason, but they're just as they're like insurance and name only uh, instead of really functioning right. And that's why I support risk rating 2.0 is a small step in, in the right direction for uh, the program. But the, the majority has noticed a couple of bills uh, that I think go backwards on that. Uh, and one of them was uh, was referenced. Uh, it would actually cut the annual NFIP premium rate hike cap from 18% to 9%. And while I couldn't agree more, it's more important that we keep flood insurance affordable for low-income policyholders, uh, particularly those that are facing high premiums. It's absolutely the wrong approach to impose an across-the-board uh, rate cap like that bill would do. And there's another bill noticed by the majority that would essentially exclude uh, adverse information as to the underwriting. So, Frank Nutter, let me turn to you. Uh, if we do rate caps or we exclude underwriting information, aren't we weakening the, quote, insurance program? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Hill. Uh, yes, I agree with that. The uh, the rate cap, and I think uh, Ms. Kuski uh, references correctly, that allows a glide path, but uh, to reduce the rate cap from 18 to 9 percent as proposed effectively is a blunt instrument. And one of the side, benef side effects of that is that it would go across the board for single family homes. It could be uh, residences, it could be uh, single family residences, it could be in areas most at need and most at risk, if you will, socially and economically vulnerable. It would, uh, it would also affect uh, the, the risk rating 2.0 as it relates to second homes, vacation properties. Uh, it seems like a blunt instrument that's actually counter to what is being done to put this program on a fiscally sound basis. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Director Kuski, you made a very interesting comment in your testimony that homeowners, potential home buyers are not notified if their house is about to tip into uh, a repetitive loss situation or, or of higher risk there. Uh, is that something that state law should deal with? How would how would a homeowner be notified about that? I thought that was an interesting comment. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's important flood risk information that's currently not making its way to homeowners. And I think it's a twofold policy solution and that we need to be working with states for improved flood disclosures, but there's also some changes that are needed so that the NFIP can release important data on flood risk to prospective home buyers and not just the current owner. Yeah, I think that was a key point in, in, in Sean Duffy's proposals earlier about increasing transparency on this, uh, making community maps, making the maps more trans, uh, transparent. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we have the NFIP program to really protect uh, mortgage holders on single family homes, let's say. But in my experience in building houses after Katrina, uh, we have a huge problem where people don't have a mortgage lien and therefore they don't uh, have any protection against flooding. And we had a lot of misallocation of mitigation money. Uh, Director Kuski, how should Congress look at insisting in true accountability uh, that mitigation money actually be spent to raise a home, for example. 
I think we need to be doing more to target mitigation dollars where they're most needed and most effective. If the question is one of sort of misappropriation of funds and fraud, that's not something that I know much about or can speak to. I can speak to the fact that we do need to do more to be uh, better spending our mitigation dollars in those areas that most Thank need. you. Let me yield, ask you to yield to Mr. Wright for the same question. Mr. Wright, how do we achieve um, better accountability and mitigation dollars that are not squandered? You know, I, I think that, again, I, the fraud pieces, which there are, are great ways to go after, I, I look at the point that goes, how do you make sure the mitigation dollars go to where it's going to be most impactful, reduce the future losses? Um, and I do think that at that point, we need to target the places of repetitive loss and then focus on communities where wide swaths of homes can all be mitigated. So the community is going to be able to rebound. It's not just going to be a few folks uh, who survive and the others who are left um, filled with water. Thank you, Mr. Wright and Mr. Cleaver. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hill. Uh, I recognize myself now for, for five minutes. Uh, I, I want to. Um, Focus uh, what the what the uh, chairwoman of the full committee uh, started uh, discussing, uh, Dr. Kuski, uh, Ms. McHugh. Um, the, the 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 NFIP is is currently uh, twenty point five billion dollars with a B in debt, uh, and every year policy providers pay approximately four hundred million dollars in interest. Uh, to service that debt. Uh, do you both believe or let me know what you believe as it relates to the uh, to, to the debt? And should to, should uh, Congress do something? Should we ignore it? Uh, uh, what, 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 what should we do as it relates to the debt? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I believe the current NFIB debt should be forgiven and some form of sufficiency standard must be adopted as an automatic long-term mechanism within the NFIP. This should ensure that a certain threshold of catastrophic events, the debt will be paid by the U.S. Treasury. Thank you for the question. I agree that that needs to be repaid. Ms. McHugh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear, hear your response. Um, so uh, I'm I, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I heard you, Dr. Kuski. Sorry, I agree the debt needs to be forgiven. I don't think that the program's going to be able to repay it on its own. Well, you know, I, I know there's criticism about the uh, Build Back Better, but the, 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 the chairwoman and others on our, our committee uh, did, in fact, uh, make that a part of Build back better, which would put us on a on a on a, on a level where we don't enter into a situation where we, all we're doing is increasing uh, uh, the amount of money we're paying on the interest and leaving a, uh, a huge uh, indebtedness. But uh, do you, do you think it makes good sense for policy holders uh, that that may already be suffering from affordability challenges uh, in cash strapped programs to pay four billion dollars just in interest payments on a debt? Uh, the NEFP will never, ever, ever repay. Uh, I, I, I would like to, to uh, ask uh, Mr. Nutter uh, for uh, your uh, response to my question. Uh, Chairman Cleaver, the, the association has uh, not taken a position with regard to payment or repayment of the debt. That's obviously a matter for the committee and the Congress to decide. Uh, Representative Hill made reference earlier to my comment that the National Flood Insurance Program is not an insurance program, but it could be. But certainly its overall financial structure needs to be put on this glide path that risk rating 2.0 uh, provides, as well as its successful use of the private sector reinsurance to support the financial integrity of the of the program. I, I, uh, I know you, you are speaking for yourself, but uh, uh, and, and so, since you are, we, we realize uh, uh, that you're not speaking for the uh, association. So, do, do you, just as an observer and knowledgeable person, person about the 
NFIP uh, program, uh, d d do you support the cancellation of the NFIP debt? I appreciate the follow-up question, Representative Cleaver. I, I, I do speak today on behalf of the association, and we really have taken no position on it. Uh, it it's important that the program be fiscally sound. Uh, we do feel like that more reliance on the private reinsurance sector would help, help support that uh, and reduce the uh, exposure that the taxpayers have to the debt of the program. All right. I, 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 uh, editorially, I just I, I just think it makes no sense whatsoever for us to walk around with a twenty point five billion dollar uh, uh, indebtedness. And uh, with that, uh, I will uh, yield back, uh, Mr. Posey. You are uh, now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Cleaver. Uh, Mr. Nutter, again, uh, if we are moving the national flood insurance program to actuarial premiums and fiscal soundness. Should we also consider taking action to transition the program of flood insurance to the private sector? Well, we certainly support uh, the complement that the uh, or supplement, if you will, that the private sector can bring to the program. The, the, the national flood insurance program policy count is largely plateaued at around 5 million policies. <clears throat> and 1% of the properties that are outside the, uh, the program uh, account for a significant amount of the flooding risk that we have in this country. Uh, the reinsurance sector stands ready uh, to support uh, private sector flood insurance. Uh, and we've offered several proposals in our testimony about how the committee could act to encourage that. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Why do you think FEMA isn't fully disclosing to the public the data and computations that it's using to compute uh, estimated flood insurance premiums? If you're directing that to me, uh, Representative Posey, uh, <clears throat> I, I can't speak for, for FEMA's uh, motivation. What I can say is that uh, we've done a lot of data analytics regarding the release by FEMA of gosh, 40 years, 45 years of claim and premium data. Uh, we've also uh, used the public release of the risk rating 2.0 data to look at communities and the impact uh, on communities and individuals that this is having. Uh, it would be valuable for FEMA to release more granular data, largely because what has been released is, is so uh, much in bulk that you really can't distinguish single family homes that are principal residences from second homes, vacation properties, investment properties. Uh, and it's difficult to distinguish the commercial side of this uh, as well. So more granular data would allow uh, the, the program uh, and other government programs to target mitigation uh, as well as to understand better uh, who who is paying what and in what communities, particularly those that are most uh, socially and economically vulnerable. Uh, thank you. Couldn't agree more. Uh, shouldn't the National Flood Insurance Program establish premiums and methods for premiums with rulemaking and comments consistent with the Administrative Procedures Act? Again, Representative Posey, if you were directing that to me and perhaps Mr. Wright that would have more insights about the use of the uh, of the act, uh, FEMA has been uh, relatively good about releasing large swaths of data related to the program uh, and made them publicly available. We've used that data, but it's very difficult, particularly for consumers and individuals to do that. Whether or not they should be using the Administrative Procedures Act, I, I just am not knowledgeable about that. Mr. Wright, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's well known that FEMA uh, is uh, very, very slow to do things through the rulemaking process uh, and follow, um, uh, as that plays. I do, though, as, as rates are being set and established each year under the current laws and regulations, uh, those are individual policy decisions that are made and published each year. They are published and follow the, the, the spirit of the, Ameri uh, of the Administrative Procedures Act, but it is not a full rulemaking process. Uh, the, the implementation of risk uh, rating 2.0 has severed the premium setting process from flood insurance uh, rate maps uh, to and, and, and cut policyholders off from an appeals process for premiums. Shouldn't FEMA take action to make it possible for policyholders to actually appeal their premiums and get access to the information they need to do that? Uh, back to Mr. Nutter again. Sir, I, I don't believe so. Uh, there is never oh, been an ability to Mr. Nutter, you think it should? 
uh, Mr. Posey, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the appeal process in a way that might be helpful. Well, don't, don't you think people that are paying the premium should at least uh, have the advantage of knowing how the premiums are set? Well, uh, absolutely. Mr. Rivera uh, made the point in his comments about uh, people relying upon insurance agents such as himself for insights about the premium setting process. There's, there's no question that transparency benefits everyone, uh, both the consumer as well as people looking to understand the consequences of the rating process uh, and the impact that it has. Yeah, and, and of course the agents don't have the information either. You know, the, the uh, FEMA is not trans, uh, trans, NFIP is not transparent enough uh, to give the agent the information he needs to really inform the customer. Uh, the lack of transparency, I think, harms everyone. And I see my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you may be muted. Mr. Chairman, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to take a moment to submit for the record uh, to the subcommittee uh, a letter from the Independent Insurance Agents uh, and Brokers of America. Uh, it states, and the uh, thank you, the uh, letter states that they support the passage of long term uh, NFIP uh, uh, program, uh, that uh, it notes that those who are insured. Um, uh, recover from a disaster uh, much more quickly. And uh, it says that FEMA needs to do more uh, to make uh, the rate, uh, the rating process uh, transparent. Um, now, uh, Mr. Wright, in the state of California, we have uh, strong real estate disclosure requirements, including uh, uh, prior property damage due to flooding. But I understand that when you're buying a home, uh, constituents uh, can't gain access to the property's National Flood Insurance Program claims history unless the seller formally requests and obtains the report uh, uh, all within a 30 to 45 day window. I understand uh, that the reason FEMA won't uh, provide this information directly to buyers or, or lessees is because of the Federal Privacy Act. Um, if there have been repeated NFIP flood claims on a home for some reason uh, and the seller doesn't disclose it, the buyer doesn't find out. Um, should the uh, uh, should, should buyers and lessees uh, have access to this information directly from uh, the uh, flood insurance program? Uh, Mr. Sherman, there, there must be a way for us to provide that information. As you know, um, real estate disclosures are almost entirely driven by state law. Um, and so some states like California make more of that available. Many states do not have that requirement. Um, there, ultimately, I think we've got to find a path, um, likely through the NFIP, to put the right kind of nudge and requirement if, if a state is going to participate in the NFIP, that this kind of transparency needs to be included in their state's disclosures. That would be helpful. And uh, certainly if a seller opens escrow to sell a property, the buyer named in that escrow ought to have access uh, to the information uh, before the transaction closes. Great. I'll point out that both uh, the chairwoman of the full committee and I represent the greatest city in America which happens to have been built in a desert and we're experiencing a drought, uh, but flood insurance is important to this entire country. And uh, that's why I'm glad uh, we're having uh, this hearing. Um, Mr. Wright, you point out in your testimony uh, that for the past six years, Congress has passed uh, 21 stop gaps. We've heard about this. Um, by some estimates, approximately uh, 1,330 home closings are delayed or canceled for every day the program lapses. What I think is not captured by that statistic is the harm done even if it's about to lapse. Uh, as people get concerned, can they sell their homes? Should they be looking for another home? Uh, can they take a job in another city? Um, can they uh, buy a larger home and sell theirs? Um, and this lapse doesn't save the federal government a penny. It just 
a loss to our society. Uh, Chairwoman uh, Waters uh, now has put forward a bill to reauthorize the program for five years. Uh, we could commend her for that. Could you speak to the benefits to home buyers, to home sellers, and the market in general uh, to be provided by a long term reauthorization of the program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that the, the marketplace, particularly in the real estate world, needs certainty that there's so many other economic factors going on that flood insurance and whether or not it will be available on the day of closing should not be part of their concern. Now, whether or not they are at flood risk should be, uh, but uh, the availability of that insurance. These increments um, are highly disruptive. They create a tremendous amount of work to turn, particularly when you get to lapses uh, that play out, to turn the program on and to turn it back off again. Um, and I, I do think that the House deserves to be complimented. You guys have put um, collectively put through bipartisan pieces that work, but so much about flood insurance is geographic and we've got to find a pathway and it may be a narrower set of reforms that get us not just a bipartisan, but be able to address those geographic concerns um, that often, at least in my estimation, have been what have kept us from getting the reauthorization. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, thank you, the gentleman yields back. Uh, now the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to uh, go into this uh, with Mr. Wright. I'm going to have a question for you, but I, I'm going to I'm going to bring back some of my colleagues uh, back a couple of years. Um, one of our former committee men, uh, committee chairs, actually Jeb Henserling, uh, used to uh, highlight and talk about repetitive lost properties. And uh, he, the story he told was this: uh, uh, there was a uh, a property outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And don't get me wrong, I love. Uh, love our uh, friends from uh, Louisiana, uh, but uh, it was a uh, modest home that was worth uh, about $60,000, which had flooded over 40, four zero times, and taxpayers had paid over half a million dollars for that property uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be rehabbed. Um, and in other words, uh, taxpayers in areas that are not prone to flooding uh, obviously subsidized homes that are at risk. And I come from Michigan, uh, near the coast. Uh, we have a, a place called the Grand River. It is a grand, uh, it is a big river and it floods. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we recently in the last couple of years had uh, finally had a county uh, effort to buy out some properties along the banks of the Grand River. Uh, there's others along here. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, when are we going to make sure that these uh, that these things are addressed? And and so, Mr. Wright, kind of to you, uh, is this scenario of our former colleague, what he discussed, uh, is that still taking place under current NFIP program or is it even still possible? It, it is still possible today. And when I was in the program, we actually did an analysis to find out how many of the properties of the nearly 5 million policies. And uh, it was less than 500 of them that were were in that most egregious um, group, uh, but we pr put proposals uh, in a number of years ago, and I believe FEMA continues to do this, to create something called extreme repetitive loss. And once you hit a certain threshold, your only option is to be mitigated or you will have to buy your insurance on the private market. You should not be able to stay inside the NFIP and continue that cycle. And, and, and is it a number of incidents or is it a dollar amount? What is that trigger? So I, I, because of there's such variance in terms of the value of properties that are there, um, I think some of the best thinking on it was looking at either the third or fourth claim by which the value of those claims um had exceeded more than two hundred thousand uh, dollars and again you don't want to push someone out yeah. who really could rebuild but you got to put a line in there and stop yeah. that cycle well, i know we had talked about three strikes and you're out uh on this committee uh various times um and but do we know how much the program has spent to rebuild those properties i don't have I don't have those numbers. I will tell you when I did that analysis a number of years ago, it was about 500. And so the overall value was not um, uh, anywhere near the scale of some of the other financial problems in the program, um, but it sends the wrong message. 
Sure. Um, and well, particularly it, with inflation, I think more homes are going to get into that group. Yeah, let's let, let we can talk about inflation, but it does seem to me that we're pre we're perpetuating keeping people in harm's way of of uh, of flooding. Uh, Mr. Nutter, um, uh, you said in your testimony, you said, "quote FEMA successfully administered its NFIP reinsurance program that transfers risk from the NFIP to the capital markets." Uh, do you think it makes sense to concentrate so much of the entire country's flood risk? Uh, onto the NFIP's balance sheet uh, alone? And how do programs like NFIP's reinsurance program help deflect those risks and mitigate it? Thank you for the question, uh, Representative Heizinga. The, the National Flood Insurance Program's risk transfer program is fairly common among government insurance programs to transfer risk into the private sector and the reinsurance sector has been very supportive of the, of the program. It is a way to diversify the risk and not as, as concentrated as it is in the National Flood Insurance Program. It's a common insurance company practice. Uh, I, I would say that, that, as I mentioned earlier, that the development of a private flood insurance market uh, that allows consumers to uh, access that and come back into the program if they choose not to stay in it would supplement the relatively plateaued number of national flood insurance program policies, which is about 5 million. Because we, you need numbers, right? I mean, to, to, to spread that out, it's just actuarial tables. Yeah, and it, that's, that's correct. And, and of course, what the program has is the most, uh, what we call adverse selection, largely the highest risk properties are likely to be those uh, in the national flood insurance program. I'll let you touch on this briefly, and Mr. Wright, maybe the rest of my time. Inflation. I, I mean, my family's in construction. Uh, I know what's been happening with uh, with availability of materials and then the cost of those uh, of those materials. What is that doing to the program as it's having to go in and rebuild properties? Yes. Yeah, so uh, just one second. Just one second. The gentleman's time has expired, but uh, at the beginning of the uh, hearing, I did go over quite a bit and with the agreement of uh of the ranking member uh, mr heisinga you you would be uh recognized to complete that uh your questioning oh great thank you mr chairman sorry i wasn't keeping track of the time so um uh, thank briefly, you I'll, I'll, and i'll be very very quick, quick congressman i um risk rating 2.0 is actually addressing uh a big piece of inflation because they're looking at the actual cost uh, of uh repairs the actual cost of reconstruction and so i think that piece is in place but the flip side of it is that because there's only $250,000 worth of coverage allowed under law, uh, as home prices have gone up, um, most homeowners don't go buy a secondary policy on, so on top. And so as we've seen that escalation, I am absolutely convinced there will be people who are submitting flood claims this year who realize that they had $370,000 worth of damage and they're only getting a $250,000 check. Um, and I think that piece plays, I think there is a related element related to the debt because it's gonna drive up interest rates, but I know that that's not the center piece of where the consumer is going to experience it. I appreciate it. And thank you for the additional time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose is now recognized for five minutes. Um, Mr. Cleaver, am I next? Okay. You are next. Sorry to Sean Cass, I thought we were doing a dem, but I was just Mr. Curious. Mr. Chairman, it's Congressman Hill briefly for a uh, just a, a parliamentary inquiry. As I have to step out of the hearing, I've asked Mr. Rose of Tennessee to represent the minority, and I thank the chairman. Thank you. Mr. Medina. Mr. Rose uh, here on here with us yet. Thank you, but I do believe it's Mr. Kasten's, uh is uh, should be up next. Thank you, Mr. Rose, uh, Mr. Chairman. With your uh, with your uh, discretion, I'll uh, I'll jump in here. Um, uh, I it, it, thank you all for this hearing. Um, I want to follow on some of the comments that Mr. Heisinger was making. I think we're we're thinking along the same lines around this issue of repetitive lost properties. And uh, and Mr. Wright, I want to thank you for giving the shout out to. Um, the bill I've got with Mr. G Mr. Blumenauer to try to address these issues. 
I, I wonder, Mr. Wright, if you could start, you explained this briefly in your testimony, but I, I wonder if you could expand on it. We've, we've all seen this FEMA data that says that for folks in repetitive loss properties, um, you can end up waiting up to five years to get a buyout. And of course, you know, as climate change keeps accelerating, those five years, you're increasingly likely to be flooded again um, and get and get stuck there. Can you can you explain sort of as, as simply as you can what it is about the current process that makes it so hard for people to get a claim honored through the program and and the degree to which this shifting to a buyout in lieu of claims methodology might might address that problem yes uh thank you uh, and i appreciate uh, the work you are doing on on this bill um what happens today is if someone is a is on multiple claims they go i want to do a buyout they have to raise their hands, submit to a, a local community who then submits to the state, who then submits to FEMA whenever the next window is there, and at which point they can be selected. And then it's got its tier back and forth. And there may be other people who have been waiting longer. And so you may not get in your first year based on the amount of money. So I spoke about in my testimony, it was after Hurricane Harvey that a lady named Edith called me and she had had a loss in 2015 of more than $100,000 claim paid, a loss in 2016, more than $100,000 thousand dollars paid and in the summer of 2017 she said mr wright can i just instead of paying my claim can you just make my buyout happen now and the answer was no i could we tried to get some authorities um, in the emergency supplemental in the fall of 2017 um, and i think that what you're proposing in this place will help solve this because and it saves money because at the point in the case of Edith, her third claim, you would subrogate another $100,000 worth of claims damage towards the buyout. Otherwise, you're gonna give them that money, they're gonna rebuild, and then three years later, you're gonna come in and you're going to demolish. But I'll go one step farther. For the family who was devastated by that event, they just wanna start over. And they don't wanna live in the mental health morass of figuring out how to live in a decrepit place in hopes that they will someday get to move on. It yeah. saves the program money and it's much better for the survivor and the insureds. Yeah, I think I think all of us, even in the Midwest, we've we've all got these flood zones and we hear those same stories and it's you, you do feel powerless. Um, it, I, I wanna ask the fiscal question and I know Mr. Hyzenga asked this and I, you were, I wanna ask it in a slightly different way, but I don't, if you don't have the answer, that's okay. You know, the, the idea we're trying to do is say not only is it a buyout, but we move you out of the flood zone. So now you're in a different area. Do you have some sense when you look at the, the claim history of NFIP when you were there, if we could get rid of those claims in these repetitive loss areas in the flood zone? Do you have any even just a ballpark sense? What does that do to the solvency of the program? What portion of the claims would we be would we be essentially taking out of the future liabilities of the program if we did this? GAO has done a couple of studies on this, and I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but this, uh, we, I spoke with Mr. Hanzinga about the kind of the, these crazy cases uh, that are out there, they're 14 times over. Uh, but these places were two or three claims. Uh, at one point, that was something like more than 40% of the payouts had been just in those places that had come back for multiple um, bites at the apple, which is why FEMA has long held that these acquisitions on repetitive loss are to the benefit of the National Flood Insurance Fund. They are better off over the long haul for making those acquisitions. Uh, Mr. Kasson, uh, this is Frank Nutter. I do have the GAO number uh, in front of me. The Their report was the repetitive loss properties from 1978 to 2019 accounted for $22.2 billion of the $69.7 billion in claims, so nearly a third. A third. Well, as my, as my old head of engineering in my last life was fond of saying, it is bigger than a bread basket. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I thank you for your time. We could we could go into this in a lot more deal. Mr. Mr. Huizenga, if you're still on, you may have dropped off. would love to work with you and try to finalize this legislation or any others on the committee. And uh, really grateful for your expertise. I yield back. Years back, uh, Mr. Rose of Tennessee, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cleaver, and I want to thank Ranking Member Hill, who had to uh, to drop off for holding this important hearing. I also want to thank our witnesses for your uh, time today and uh, being a part of our first hearing on flood insurance this Congress. As my time is limited, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. Mr. Nutter, in your testimony, 
you mentioned reforms to create resilient and insurable communities. Can you please discuss those, including the Community Disaster Resilience Zones proposal? Uh, Representative uh, Rose, thank you for the question. The, the, uh, we, we call it CEDARS, if you will, as a typical Washington acronym. Uh, what it would do is uh, it, it, would, it would take FEMA's National Risk Index uh, and put it in a statutory state, essentially expecting and requiring that federal programs like FEMA's programs and HUD programs would direct the mitigation dollars toward communities that have been identified as, as uh, these community disaster resilience zones and prioritize those communities that are both at risk to natural disasters, but also socially and economically vulnerable. Uh, the proposal in its fullest context would also provide uh, federal assistance to local communities to issue bonds focused on resilience efforts in those communities. Uh, as well as uh, private sector bonds that would get the benefit of the tax exemption. So the proposal largely is designed to uh, enhance the ability of communities to identify what they see as being appropriate resilience measures, but with the assistance and support of the federal government. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Nutter, in February 2019, regulators issued a final rule clarifying how lending institutions may accept private flood insurance policies. Since that time, has private flood insurance increased its market share? Representative Rose, it really has not. Uh, the private flood insurance market, uh, unfortunately, uh, competes, if you will, with the National Flood Insurance Program with the subsidized rates and the assistance that goes there. Uh, we have been working with state insurance commissioners to facilitate a process at the state level uh, to get uh, companies, to encourage companies to be part of that. But we do feel like that some things need to be done uh, at the federal level. And one of those is Representative Luchtemeyer's proposal for continuous coverage that would allow policyholders in the National Flood Insurance Program to access the private market. If they choose not to take that option, they can come back into the program without losing their status. So there are things that can be done, but the, the private flood insurance market is still very nascent. Aside from just the competitive disadvantage that the private market may be at, what are the other, you may have referred to one of those, what are the other governmental barriers that prevent the private flood market from expanding and offering better options to consumers? Well, one is being dealt with, with risk rating 2.0. Uh, that is that risk rating 2.0 is now focused on individual properties. Uh, as well as, the, as Mr. Wright has mentioned, the replacement costs. It's more akin to the way insurance companies look at uh, risk and evaluate risk. So I would expect risk rating 2.0 to have the value, the, the, the residual value, if we will, of encouraging private companies to see where the rating is, uh, those ratings are, and then to uh, see whether they can compete either on service or price with all that. And then, um Shifting uh, again, uh, Mr. Nutter, what are some of the ramifications of being suspended from the NFIP program for not following proper floodplain management guidelines? And I'm not sure that I'm the best one to, uh, to address that. Maybe Mr. Wright can address that. But uh, I, I obviously, it's an important feature of the program to deal with both floodplain management, if you will, and mitigation as well as the insurance component of it. It's a partnership between those two features. Uh, I, I would encourage Mr. Wright to uh, to address that if he'd sure. like to. Mr. Wright, if you don't mind. Yep. Very simply, it, it is a quid pro quo uh, when you join the National Flood Insurance Program. You've got to put those pieces in place. Ms. McHugh actually leads that program in Missouri, where it's her job to make sure that people follow through. And that's why how insurance is made available. Uh, if anything, FEMA is very, very patient. Uh, it takes a long, long path before you ever get to the fully suspended line. And what impact, uh, if any, does this have on private insurance, uh, the private insurance market for flood in the areas where? Uh, uh, if anything, it, it once that um, you have been suspended, the private market is the only place you can get insurance. Okay. Uh, Chairman Cleaver, I see my time has expired. I yield back. Yields back. Uh, the the uh, chair recognizes now Mr. Style. He's still with us. Uh, Mr. Timmons, you have five minutes. 
I don't think Mr. Timmons is, is with us, uh, in which case I would like to uh, thank all of the witnesses for their uh, testimony today. And without objections, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion uh, in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to email address uh, uh, provided to your office. A submission for the record, a letter from the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies urging Congress to provide a long-term reauthorization of the NFIP that contains reforms designed to create more certainty for policyholders by putting the program on a path towards solvency. Without objection, this hearing is now adjourned.